So let me give an apologetic before I give my teaching on apologetics. <laughs> my apologetic is Just don't apologize. Right. Is you may not see me using the Bible a lot tonight. And the reason is that Fred Smith took two weeks to lay a biblical theological foundation and framework for what I'm going to be talking about. Um, my colleague Josh Etro and I wrote a book called Apologetics at the Cross, and the first two chapters are the biblical foundation of apologetics. The second two chapters are the historical foundation for apologetics. But that's not what we're going to do tonight, okay? So we're just going to assume I, the truth, and that is that Fred has already uh, laid a biblical and theological framework for what we're going to talk about. So I'm just going to talk about method the method that actually can be found in the scriptures, uh, that's grounded in the scriptures, but I'm not going to go to chapter and verse on every single one of them. So the method is called the inside-out approach. And um, my colleague and I uh, designed this approach, mostly my colleague. He's actually written another book called Telling a Better Story, in which he develops this whole inside-out approach, and it won uh, Christianity Today's Book of the Year in Apologetics. So it's, it's, he took this and just took it a little further. Um, so it, it's a pr approach, and when, when my colleague and I sat down to write a book, we didn't want to write a book about apologetics that would function within elite, high-level academics. Um, sometimes when we think about uh, apologetics, especially if we see it on YouTube, we think of two really smart people debating each other. And, and when the Christian wins, we go, yay, okay? We, we won, we, we obviously are right. And when we looked at the inside out approach, our approach actually was how can we have better conversations with people who don't know Jesus to show why our faith stands up intellectually, but not just intellectually, it, it, it relates to who we are as people and the world we live in and makes more sense. Okay, does that make sense? So if you think in terms not of debates or not of a academic intellectuals, but as having a conversation with your family and friends, and I'll give an illustration uh, how I blew it this week. Uh, but I think it, it, I didn't blow it terribly badly, but it was one of those opportunities I had that I didn't, I, I knew what to do after the fact. Um, so the inside out model insists that the gospel and a robust Christian theology be at the center of apologetic interactions and woven into the di dialogue throughout. Um, and so we have this goal of starting with another person's assumptions to create space in order that they might consider some of the problems with their own outlook and be willing to consider the plausibility of Christianity. So we also actually start on their turf and with their assumptions and with the way they see the world, okay? And I'm gonna say something else about that. It isn't just to help them see that their, the way they view the world isn't truly livable if they really are consistent and that, that it's uh, contradictory. But, and I, again, I'm gonna talk about this in a second, but it's also to draw them out. I think the proverb says that, um, the, the, you know, the waters of the heart, they're, they're deep, but the man of understanding can draw them out, okay? And so part of the reason you start with their assumptions and you start with who they are is so that you can draw them out, okay? So, but let me say that what this means is we wanted to design something. Like, our apologetic approach was to get to the gospel, okay? It wasn't to win an argument, and it, it, it was primarily to how can we get this person to Jesus? And so, throughout the whole process, there's ways to connect people to Jesus. Now, there is, I know, there is a traditional model out there to do apologetics, and I know because I studied under the master, Norm Geisler, okay? 
and uh, I had Norm Geisler for class. If you ever, if you've looked at much into apologetics, you probably have heard the name Norm Geisler. And he and I, even in Dallas, Texas, um, on South Central Expressway, held pick out, picket signs together at an abortion clinic back in the 80s. Okay, so I knew Norm, uh, but I met actually I met Norm's son David. Um, He's a wonderful person and got to know him uh, last semester. Okay, but the, the classical way to do apologetics, and I was going to write it up, but I'm going to imagine with me, okay? The, there's, it's a building block approach. First, you have to teach pers a person basically the laws of logic. You've got to help them to learn to think logically, okay? The second step is theism. You've got to convince them there is a God. There is a God, okay? So you argue for theism. You've, you've got logic, and then on that is theism, and then you build um, the next case is Jesus and historical evidence that he was the Messiah, the Son of God. He rose from the dead. And then on top of that, once you get, get there, the gospel, okay? If you'll think about that, that's very academic and very logical, but most of our conversations, you're not going to pull out a napkin and be able to go from teach a person logic, theism, uh, you know, the, show them the minimal uh, Habermas's minimalist facts argument for the resurrection, mm -hmm. and then get to the gospel, okay? The, the conversations don't work like that, and, and really today in late modernity, uh, people don't think in that kind of, they think more in here and there and there, very disconnected ways. Does that make sense? And they think out of here a lot. Out of the, and I don't see a problem with that. In fact, I think God makes us whole people, and we do think with our hearts. So I don't see a problem with it. I just see, um, I see a, a problem when people just look inside themselves for truth. Okay? That's when the problem comes. The affections and, and our desires are God-given, uh, but when we begin to think that they are the sole source of truth, that's when the problem happens, okay? So, um, we're going to say the, the goal uh, of, of st is starting with another person's assumption. So, we'll look at that in just a moment, but I want, let's see, um, this is probably going to say what I just said. Uh, but furthermore, the inside-out model suggests that the apologist, instead of attempting to get a believer to build along with him based on preconceived apologetic building plan or assumed framework for rationality, which they may or may not share, focus on points where Christianity overlaps with the view of the other person. Okay? If, you'll, if you've ever heard of Augustine's massive tome, The City of God, he spends the first ten books in the Greco-Roman world, hardly mentioning a scripture, okay? There's scripture, but he just starts and he begins to poke away, okay? He looks at their longings, what they want, their desires, but he begins to show the inconsistency and that what they truly want cannot be met within the way, way they view the world, within their framework. The second part of the book, verse, uh, books 11 through 22, is chunk full of Scripture. It's the whole biblical narrative. And he shows how the Christian story and way of living in the world is a better way. Okay? Does that make sense? But he has to start with where they are to get them to begin to open up to a better story, a better gospel, better truth. Okay? So... What we try to do is we start, we have the gospel at the center of conversations. The gospel is orbiting around all, uh, in, the whole, in, all of the, uh, in all of the conversation. And what this is, is whether it's an Eastern religion, Islam, skeptical, postmoderns, nihilism, secular humanism, there's places where they overlap, okay? But then there's places where Christianity challenges. Okay, does that make sense? So we, we start, though, here, okay, with the person. Hello. Um, any questions so far um, 
All right. So now the inside out methodology is, um, is, the, is framed with a series of diagnostic questions. So you go inside their world first, right? And then you go outside to the Christian story. And actually, you can, if, if you're, the better we get at this, the better that we actually show them where their story fits within a, a larger Christian story, okay? And um, now here's, here's the little bit of drawback with this method, is we as Christians, we have to live an integrated life. We have to be living in the story of God. We have to be, and it has to be integrated in our emotions, in the way we relate to other people, at work, our finances, um, all aspects of our lives. It has to be integrated. In order to help another person see how relevant Christianity is to their lives, it has to be relevant to our lives. So sometimes, you know, sometimes this other apologetic method can be a little easier because all it is is arguments. Let me give you five reasons for the resurrection. Let me give you five, five uh, uh, the five reasons that God is, exists. It can stay a, it can stay kind of distant and cognitive, but what I'm recommending here, and I think it's more grounded in the gospel, is it, it takes it takes um, our whole lives, and it takes a, and it believe me, it takes our whole lives to integrate the gospel into our lives, and we will die, and it will not be fully integrated. Okay, there's new areas where Christ wants lordship in our lives, and it'll be all of our lives. But we, we won't have a prayer of helping others to know the truth of Christianity through this methodology if we're not in integrating it and know how the story of God relates to our personal story. Okay, so that's something that's very important, and that's why Steve and I were talking before um, before the, the, the session um, that my colleague and I, Josh Chateau, have written another book called uh, The Augustan Way, and it's a book on apologetics, and we just turned in the manuscript. And what we discovered is the key to apologetics is the local church. That uh, apologetics has been done by parachurch ministries. You see them on YouTube and online, and they've been done by the academics, the brainiacs, but real apologists should be formed in, in the community of the local church. And that's where apologetic apologetics needs to be done at the street level where we live. Does that? Now that we don't have to buy your book. That was good. That's right. You've got the thesis. <laughs> go do it. Go, you know, go, go and do it. So um, that book is, yeah, you probably won't want to buy it anyway. <laughs> uh, no, I'm. Well, we could. I'd like to be able to do that. I would devour it. We 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 would like to do that, but ends up we usually buy our own. <laughs> we have to buy our own. But okay, so the inside out. Let me just kind of show you quickly. I'll give you a quick overview, and then I'll just kind of go through this. Um, is you go inside the other person's view, and we say, what can we affirm, and what do we need to challenge, and then we try to let them see where their view would lead. If they're consistent with their, with, if they would live consistently with what they say they believe, where would that take them really? Okay? And then we, we go outside and um, where do the competing narratives, that is the Christian story and the skeptics story, where have they borrowed from the Christian story? A lot of times they're making these strong points like, well, Christians are too judgmental. In Western society, where did we get the concept that you shouldn't judge? From Christianity. From Christianity. So they're borrowing capital from Christianity, not, not coming out of their own worldview, but they're borrowing. And, and recently there's been a book written by Tom Holland called Dominion, and what he shows is even though we live in a post-Christian world yeah, and that really Christianity is still the most dominant effect on Western society, that people still think, and the guy who wrote it's an atheist. 
but he has to admit Christianity has this grip on the way people think. And people, now they pick and choose, though, okay, what parts of it uh, that, they, that they want. So where are they borrowing from Christianity? And then how does Christianity better address our experiences, observations, and history? Okay, does that make sense? So first of all, uh, we go, and by the way, I actually have done this um, with people, uh, you know, on airplanes and stuff, and you don't say, okay, now I'm going to do the first diagnostic question, <laughs> and now I'm going to do the second one. You know, sometimes, it, it, sometimes you might start at four, you know, because that's just where the conversation is and where it works. This is just basic scaffolding. I think you have to ask good questions, and this is where, um, in my illustration that I'll give in a little bit, where I, I didn't ask a good question. But I think you can ask, and what we want to do is tell too much, I think. And this culture doesn't like Christianity. I mean, it's, whereas I, I still hold to my point, they don't know it, but they're thinking in Christian categories. But, but this culture sees Christianity as the problem. It used to be, it's just, it's not bad, but, but, uh, but it's not true. But now it's not true and it's bad, Christianity, okay? So how do you, people are automatically antagonistic and they're in like combat mode. Uh, so it is very difficult to even get in a conversation. And so if you start showing they're illogical, the, uh, the effective nature, the emotional nature is, is probably going to, to, over, to, to, you know. I think you can get there, but I think a lot of calming down has to, and trust has to be built. And so I think I might go into what can we affirm, what do we challenge. After writing the book, I actually did a talk uh, at the Gospel Coalition. And b by the way, someone got so mad at me that they almost attacked me. Uh, at the end of the, at the end, it was, I, I, as soon as I finished, and, and it's starting to, some of it's fading, yeah, yeah. and I don't mean to caricaturize him, yeah. but he did have like a handlebar mustache. He looked like he just got off his Harley, and I could smell cigarettes on him, and he, what he did is he looks at me and says, does that stuff work, okay? He goes, um, does that stuff work? And I'm taken back for a second, and, um, I mean, people are looking at me, and he says, I see, I think we need to be more extreme. That's what he said. He goes, I think we need to be more extreme. And so I, I said, what do you mean? Do you mean extreme like I need to get a cross in a big Bible and go downtown and, and shout the gospel? Do you mean I need to perform a miracle? What do you mean by extreme? You know, I wanted to know. And he didn't know what he meant. And he realized he's talking to someone probably with a PhD, and I could watch him all of a sudden realize, what did I just get him myself into? And I became very gen I was going to live what I just talked. I wanted to talk to this guy. And, um, and he goes, I just don't think that works. I don't think that'll, I don't think that'll work. And so I, I realized we had gone long, which I tend to do, and and they wanted to get us out for the next um, seminar, and so he, I was trying to find him, I mean, and he snuck out and left, but I mean, he char, everybody saw it, he charged uh, down to to get me, because um, I I think what I'm saying challenges some notions of what we need to be doing as. In, in our witness. If we just keep it at a cognitive le level these days, it's just going to be tit for tat. It's going to be, you know, like if you say, I can prove that Jesus wrote from the dead, they're going to go, they're going to go online and Google why he didn't. And it's just going to get nowhere because they're already predisposed. But Jesus had an ability, whether it was Nicodemus, to Nicodemus he said, you know, your good is not so good that I, you don't need me to save you. And he said to the woman, well, your bad's not so bad that I can't save you. But he went to their hearts. He went down into where they were. 
And I think at this first, we have to begin with their assumptions and, and rather than our arguments. Does that make sense? But this takes time. We actually, I, the thing I'm disappointed in my life right now is that I'm with Christians all the time. I mean, I work at a Christian Union. I like Christians, though. I love Christians, okay? I'm not saying that. And that's probably why I'm with Christians all the time, is I love Christians. But, but, you know, I'd like to have more time to spend with those who don't know Jesus. But, the, but first, we start with where they are. And there might be some things that we can affirm with the other person. There might be, especially in our, um, you know, in, in our... Um, culture, there's a strong, oftentimes there's a strong sense of justice. Believe it or not, there is a strong sense of morality in our culture. It's just not our morality. Oh, they make moral judgments that our faith is wrong oftentimes, and it's a moral imperative to them. And there are others, you know, they're burning cities. There are, and you, we look at it as immoral, but to them, so at least we agree there are things in life that we ought to be doing, and there are other things in life that we shouldn't be doing. We can agree with that, okay? So we'll affirm, affirm that, that there is a moral. And the way you go then is, where did that come from? You know, that's what you begin to say then. What do you think, why do you think we have that? Did it evolve? Well, evolution would explain the opposite. I mean, evolution wouldn't take us to this idea of morality, okay? Does that make sense? Um, Okay, so we begin with their assumptions, maybe things that we agree on, and oftentimes the things we agree on, probably Christianity, some of that Christianity brought into the culture anyway. Um, and then, uh, by the way, what I'm going to do next week is I'm just going to review it, and then I've got, at the end of tonight, I've got an, an, a, a, a situation, a, sen a scenario, okay, a, a real scenario an example of a skeptic and their charge against Christianity. And what we'll do is read the paragraph and then we'll go back through this and say, what would we say to the person? Okay, does that make sense? So if it seems a little right now ethereal, we're gonna get very concrete before, before we're done. Okay, so um, then we, we might say, um, what do we need to challenge? in the person's beliefs. There might be logical inconsistencies and we can sign a point, kind of point that out, okay? Or here's a great question, how's that working for you? <laughs> you know, how is that, how's that working for you? So you begin to create, what you're doing is you're causing them to doubt their skepticism. Does that make sense? You're causing them, uh, Keller says, doubt their doubts. What you're doing is that, uh, that strong assurance that they have, you're creating a little space that maybe they're not so right. Maybe, maybe there's other views uh, that are, um, um, are more consistent, okay? And then we ask, where does, this, where does it lead? Where does it lead, okay? One of the things we like to say, uh, talk about is, if I can unpack this a little bit, is in general, people have what we've called this God-shaped vacuum, right? They got this hole in the soul. But most people in our culture don't feel it, okay? So if we say, you know that empty space inside of you? I know what needs to fill it. They'll say, what empty space? Why? Okay? Because they're in college and they're getting a degree and they're looking for someone to marry. And then they're gonna marry that person. And see what you mean, there's, there's the next thing. And then they, and by the way, college students, they also got this, okay? And so every second, they can distract themselves away from the emptiness, okay? And so the things I've just mentioned are not bad. In fact, God has embedded these as meanings in the world they're just not the ultimate meaning. Does that make sense? So if we say, your life has no meaning, what do you, they'll say, well, what do you mean my life has no meaning? I, I've got kids, I'm going out, I'm working hard, I'm providing a service, I'm, I, I love my wife. Well, that is a meaning, but it's not an ultimate meaning, okay? 
So I'm, I'm going somewhere with this. So I, um, I, I did a talk once in a, to a, graduate, a graduating class there. there and I, I, the title was How to Lose Your Faith After You Leave the Christian School. And, and I, I explained this process to them that they would, you know, they, they would look for that marriage partner and then they would have kids and they would be very busy building a career. And then they would go on vacations and then they would have grandkids. And then one day they die. Okay? They die. And they would fill themselves, their lives with all of these different things which felt very meaningful. But if there is not a God, and this is where it is, where does it lead? If there is not a God, did it really mean anything? Does any of that have any real meaning? It was here, it was gone. And so you ask them, how does that, how does this, your view, lead to ultimate, deep, me, the meaning why humans are here? Okay? Why do we do these things? You know, we know it's to glorify God. The other thing is people who, um, let's say, don't believe in God, um, you can, you know, you can press on them to say, um, but what does that say about your life and any meaning at all, any morality, any, why do you have any morality? Okay, your view, if it was logically consistent, I could go up and kill somebody and it really, it's nothing. It's just nothing. It's just an act, and it, it doesn't have any real meaning. So you try to draw them out to, you know, help them to look at the things they think have meaning. Do they really? Do they really? And, and you're asking these questions. Does that make, make sense again? Um, and like, but you know what philosophers are saying, and I, I like that they're saying this because I think they're going to find out there's a problem with it. There are actually philosophers now uh, who don't like the new atheists because they're mean and they're angry. They're atheists who like Christianity because they think that Christianity has brought some goods into the world. Now, I know this conflicts with what's happening on the ground, but there are actually atheists who aren't as angry. But you have to ask them still, where does this, where does your view ultimately lead? I mean, and why is Christianity even for you a good thing if there's no real meaning? It's all a farce. In fact, um, Augustine, I think it was the, the historian Vero, uh, he kept pointing out to Vero, you don't really believe in these pagan gods. You just think their rituals are good for the empire because they indoctrinate people into the empire. Does this make sense? So the, the pagan uh, worship actually helps the empire, and that's why this historian, this ancient historian, thought they were religion was good. It wasn't because it was true. It's what it did for society. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay, so we try to get the person to see, if you live like this, where is this going to lead? And today, a social issue is we know that the trans movement and the feminist movement are going to come. They're going to right here, you know. And so getting people to, okay, right now, LGBTQ community feels warm and inviting and loving. It really does. It feels, for a lot of people, a lot better than the church does because they let me be me. But they're going to get it. They're going to, the tribes will start. It's going to, it, they're going to conflict. Does this with each other? Because you, logically and consistently, they can't hold. It won't hold. And, um, okay. So I don't think, this is one of the problems. I think a lot of elite uh, professors in universities aren't concerned about what they're teaching. Where is it going to lead? Okay. Where is it going to lead? They got a lot of, in my opinion, okay, you know, this, they probably won't put this out um, uh, on the podcast, but in my opinion, a lot of times, uh, you know, as a, as a parent at Liberty University, I feel responsible for the kids that come there, and I feel responsible to their parents because I've been a parent. But I think that a lot of times in elite universities, 
professors like being rock stars. They like having the edgy thing, the thing that goes against maybe what their parents or what their tradition. Does that make sense? And it, it's just, it, it makes them the cool hip. Um, finally, we've, you know, the kids feel like they found what's right because everybody's been lying to them all their lives. That's, that's an opinion. Um, but I don't think we're asking this question in our culture. Where is this going to lead? Where are we headed? We're very, they're very too much concerned about the now. Okay? And then we move outside to, um, to kind of Christianity and the gospel and the Christian story. And again, the transition, we don't just wooden and you know, legalistic go through the points. So we go again here, where do the competing narratives have to borrow from the Christian story? Um, so where are they actually trying to, looking at um, their views and, and saying, uh, and not aware that this movement against human trafficking, where did that come from? The mu movement to love the poor, and care for uh, the marginalized. Where did that view come from? And they're borrowing part of Christianity without, bar bar without tapping into what is most central, and that is the gospel, okay? But you show how these things are connected to the Christian story, the Christian gospel, right? Um, and then um, how does Christianity better address our experiences, observations, and history? We think that Christianity better connects with the reality of what we experience, the fallenness, the loneliness, the brokenness, um, the, uh, the way science works, uh, the way history has come about. We feel like the Christian story is a much better explanation than anything else on the table. For example, um, why do we, in the Western world, we have science? Well, two things. One is we believe in a God of natural law. And on that basis, we believe things can be, are observable and repeatable, and that um, there's this natural law that's been encoded, embedded in creation, and we can study it. The second reason uh, science developed in Western civilization is because the heavens declare the glory of God. And if we study the creation, we will see the glory of God, okay? And so our framework, Christianity, led to the modern scientific movement. Does that make sense? And so our framework is a better framework for science. Not only that, the Christian faith chastens science. I don't know about you, but I don't believe science has all the answers. <laughs> Because I had a mom who had diseases and every doctor in the world for 20 years tried to figure out what was wrong and they couldn't. And I'm thinking, here's, what, here's my, my cynical thing. It's like, so you can't tell me what's wrong with my mom and you think you know how the world started and how it came about. It, Christianity chastens science. Science has a function within the Christian story, but it is not the Christian story. Does that make sense? And people uh, who are trying to make it the story, it, it, that it doesn't, it doesn't, it can't do that. You're asking science to do something. It can't even explain, um, it, it can't even explain a philosophy for itself. It's uh, reasoning for science has to be, uh, we have to come up outside of it to explain why science should exist. Make sense? Okay, so these are the kinds of things that we, we um, talk about how Christianity better addresses our experience, our observations, and the history. Um, and, and I think my, my wife has taught me, uh, when I was a pastor, she, like, I, the worship leader would have a bad day and um and then i would have breakfast on monday and i came back one time and said you just said it didn't you what 
you just told him what, how bad it was. <laughs> yeah. He goes, what? Why didn't you ask him, like, how he thought it went? That would have been a lot better. Now, you might have had to say, well, you know, I didn't see it that way. <laughs> I didn't see it as going that way. But, but my wife has taught me that if we will ask good questions, that people... Um, now, there comes a point where we declare the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I mean, the gospel is the gospel. It's uncompromising. It's true. Um, but yet, to relate the gospel in this late modern world that's very complicated, um, where people aren't like you and I, Steve, grew up knowing Sunday school stories and having um, the whole um, vernacular of Scripture. In this world, I think that what we helps in apologetics is to go beyond just the cognitive down to the uh, affective and uh, to understand um, what a person is feeling and thinking. And I, and I don't mean thin emotionalism, okay? Not that. It's thick. Uh, it's the tra Christian tradition of thick emotions that, that C.S. Lewis talked about, uh, Jonathan Edwards talked about, St. Augustine talked about, and John Piper talks about. Um, okay, let me give you, this is the teaser for when we come back, okay? This is an actual email that was sent to a Liberty student, okay? This is actual. Um, and let me read the intro here. So, a Christian student recently asked me, and this is my co-author co Josh Chateau, when he was a teacher at Liberty. A, a Christian student recently asked me for help with a friend. Let's call her Sarah who is a self-described secular humanist. Whenever my student tried to approach Sarah about Christianity, she kept bringing up moral issues she had with Christianity and eventually even wrote out a reply that went something like this, okay? Now, what this girl wanted to do, this Liberty student, the Liberty student, she wanted Josh Chateau, Dr. Chateau, to give her arguments to prove that the Bible's the Word of God, okay? And Basically, what would have happened is they would have had a cognitive interaction and this girl would have gone back and Googled her reasons they weren't true and it wouldn't have functioned near as well, okay? It, it would not have worked. So let me read this. This is going to sound familiar to people you work with, maybe go to school with. Um, this, this skeptical person wrote this. Every week, religious leaders are telling people that they have to do such and such because God has commanded it. I think it's wrong to condemn anyone or seek to regulate their lives like that. And especially not just because some supposed God or religion tells you to do so. I don't want to live that way. It doesn't even seem humane. See, they don't... <laughs> the, where are they getting their categories for humane? Probably from Christianity. But it doesn't seem humane. Simply quoting a bunch of antiquated religious texts written by men over a long period of time isn't going to change my opinion. Of course, I don't think the Bible can be taken seriously. but That doesn't make me a relativist. I'm not a relativist. I believe in truth. My truth, right? In fact, I don't see that us as different. You validate your opinions and way of life by citing the Bible. I validate mine by looking to my hopes and desires. If someone wants to become a priest or a prostitute or anything in between, though I could, could judge them, I don't. I just wish them the best and move on with my life. It has been fun chatting, to be honest, but to be honest, I see Christianity not only as irrelevant, but also dangerous because it dehumanizes people by suppressing their ability to make personal choices and find personal fulfillment in life. I, there's a lot of these out there today, okay? And so how in the world are we going to be able to begin? But these are the people we love. I mean, they might irritate us a little bit, okay? But these are the people we love. These are, these are our cousins and our uh, nieces and nephews and people in our family and people at work. And so what we're going to do next week is we're going to go take the inside out method and I'm going to get you to say, what should we do, okay? What can we do? Uh, with this.